Good morning, everyone. Happy morning to you, Center Point people. Center Point peeps. Center peeps. Does that work? Good morning, Center peeps. Oh, that's awkward. That's awkward. Somebody has to keep a rein on that guy. That's what I'm saying. Would you stand up with us and we're going to lift our voices, lift our hearts, lift our hands, maybe, lift our heads. Right? Look to the heavens, look to our Lord, look to our God. Let your name the mountain shake and crumble. Let your name the oceans roar and tumble. Let your Shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, oh Lord. Yahweh. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name. Hey, 
Amen. Have a seat this morning. Well, good morning. It's great to see you. Welcome to Centerpoint Community Church. My name is Tony. I'm the youth and outreach pastor here at Centerpoint. And to our first time guests in the room, I want to wish you a spe special welcome here today. Thank you for trying out a new place and for that place to be here. We have a favor to ask you if, you if you're up for it. We'd love it if you'd fill out the contact card today. You can find it in the back of the seat right there in front of you. Let us know who you are and how you heard about us, what brought you by today. You can drop this in the offering plate that's going to be coming by in our service a, little, a few minutes from now. And we want to encourage everyone to use the response side of the card, especially the I Need Prayer section. Our staff prays for you every single week with these cards that come in, so fill that out today, drop it in the offering plate when it comes by a little bit later on in our service. I've got some announcements for you this morning. Uh, first one is in connection to two weeks from right now, two weeks from today, immediately following our worship service, we're having our annual business meeting. Uh, yeah, hoo, see, he's excited. He's getting ready. <laughs> I think it's because he's leaving town. He's excited, too. Um, we're going to be doing that. It's, it's, it really is an exciting gathering. It doesn't sound like it, but we get to celebrate a little bit in that meeting. What God did in 2018, the future that we're looking forward to this year in 2019. So that is immediately after the service. Now, if you're a parent or a grandparent or a guardian with a kiddo over in the kids' town area, don't worry about trying to rush out of service and, and get them. They've got special Valentine's crafts planned for them, so they are good to go back there. You can hang out here, go to the meeting. You can pick them up, go up into Fellowship Hall for after the annual chili cook-off. Oh, yeah, listen to this guy. Um, so in regards to the chili cook-off, if you want to help bring something or, or perhaps be involved as a judge, now, if you're being a judge, you will be sampling all of them, including the hot, so keep that in mind. But we do need help for judging. If you'd like to bring something like cornbread or some chili or cheese, check out all the sign-up spaces out in the community center. Glenn, give me a nice wave. If you see over there by Glenn's door, that's where the community center is. You can find out all the information. at the. You can, you can stop waving now. Thanks. We're, we got it. He's got that big, ugly Steelers sweater on. You'll know where to find it. Hey, I love you, Glenn. Um, so that's, that's information for the chili cook-off coming up in two weeks from today. Now, Leading up to that, there's still other events happening at Centerpoint the Saturday before, which is actually this coming Saturday. There is a men's breakfast that's going on in the, in the fellowship hall. Uh, you can sign up for that at the community center. More info in the bulletin. Ladies, one of your gatherings is coming up here on a Wednesday night on January 23rd. It's called the Beautiful Word Gathering. We hope that you'll be there. There's a dinner at 6 p.m. that night. And then a time of exploring God's word, connecting with each other. Again, that's here on a Wednesday night, the 23rd at 6 p.m. Hope that you will be around for that. And then when it comes to other things, please check your bulletin. There's a lot going on. We want to remind you um, about the students tonight, 6th through 12th grade students. We're having our board games and brownies night. So uh, homemade, homemade brownies, bring a board game to play or a card game. We actually have a guest speaker coming in tonight. That's going to be really, really awesome. So that's 6th through 12th grade tonight at 6 p.m. And we also want to remind you as well, we had the, uh, the grief share, loss of a spouse, one-day seminar this last week. Excellent content, excellent stuff to help people through that. And the, the full 13-week course is going to be starting up very, very soon. So I wanted you to kind of take a look at the screen and learn a little bit more about our Grief Share ministry. Grief Share is a support group ministry that helps people heal from the pain of grief. The Grief Share video seminars, workbook exercises, and small group discussions give participants encouragement, useful advice, and hope. The Grief Share videos are, are excellent. The video strengthened me. It's a freeing kind of thing to be able to talk about your loss. My workbook helped me to unravel the feelings I was going through. If you know people in your church or community who are grieving the death of a loved one, tell them about Grief Share. Or visit a Grief Share group yourself to heal from the pain of your grief. There was such a void until I got into Grief Share. I never really healed down deep until I came to Grief Share. Grief Share brought me out of my sadness. Begin your journey from mourning to joy at Grief Share. <clears throat> Second Sunday of the month is our missions moment and uh, our focus this morning is on Shannon's Hope. It's a maternity home here in Arvada and 
You can know more about it. It's at the bottom of the uh, sermon outline. You can pick that up. Hopefully you've got a copy as you came in. They work with pregnant women 16 years of age and older, but it's unique in that they are working with women who are victims of domestic violence, substance abuse, or homelessness. And so it's a ministry that we support here as, uh, as our church, and uh, we just want to have a word of prayer for that ministry as they reach out to young women and who are dealing with very difficult situations. But we also are very privileged here to have missionaries all the way from Africa. Adam and Gina are here with us. Welcome, you guys. Welcome home. Oh, man. Oh, man. So glad to have you guys. And we're, in the weeks ahead, we'll, we'll hear more from you guys up front and personal if you can work that into your busy schedule. So, all right, let's pray. Father God, thank you for this, this gathering here today. We thank you for the new year. We thank you for the potential that you have given us once again, a year of new beginnings, a, a year of new things that you bring into our lives, a year of new opportunities to reach people for Christ. Lord, we pray that uh, you would use our time together in that regard. Lord, we lift up Shannon's hope, and we thank you for her, their ministry with young women for, for decades. And so, Lord, we ask that you would use their efforts to further your kingdom, Lord, that they would extend grace and love to these very needy young women. And, Lord, that their lives would be changed because of what Shannon's hope is seeking to do. Thank you so much for meeting us here this morning. We love you, Lord, in your name. Amen. Let's get back to our time of worship and song. Thank you, Pastor Paul. Well, we're going to jump back on in. Can you guys stand up with us? I'd love to see you uh, put your hands together and make some noise on this song.
take a moment and pray. We bring our hearts and our minds quietly before the Lord. Your grace is enough, Lord. We, uh, we sometimes doubt and we sometimes wonder, especially if we're going through difficulty. But you do prevail. You do sustain. You do meet us in our need, God. And we give you thanks. And now is our turn to come to the altar, come before you, come with our hearts humbly before us, before you. very, very difficult, maybe impossible to stand before you and worship you with pride and arrogance in our hearts. But you invite us and you make a way for us to come before you, come to the altar with our hearts broken in humility, aware of our need, aware of our fragility, our frailty, us up, and you show us the way, and you give us strength, and you give us hope, and you give us direction.
Savior. Gentlemen, if you'd make your way forward to wait upon us for any gifts of offering or tithes that you've come prepared. By the way, thank you so much for your faithfulness, dear church, to this ministry, in your serving and in your giving. Father God, we give you our thanks that you invited us to your table to become one of your children, that you granted us forgiveness and continue to do so as we seek to live after you but fail so often. Thank you that you extend your grace and that your mercies are new each and every morning. And Lord, as we've come here to to give of our worship, to give of our worship in song and in giving, and Lord, as we gather around your word, may you be pleased. 
May our hearts overflow. May your spirit speak to us. And Lord, as we give these gifts, we give with confidence that you will use them for the furtherance of your kingdom here in Arvada on this little hill and across this world. So thank you for meeting us here. Thank you for multiplying our gifts. Thank you for allowing us the freedom to gather. And Lord, we give you our praise evermore. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life.
so good, God. A foundational truth. You are not out to harm. You are not out to bring sorrow. You are a good God, full of love, full of grace, full of righteousness, power, and justice. You are good. Isn't our God good? Yes. Karen, how you doing, girl? <laughs> you had one of those weeks, didn't you? Yes. You did, but God is still good, right? Yes. Right? And Adam and Gina, we've been praying for you guys that God would bring you home safely. God is good. And he's got good things for you in store, right? Who else? How has God been good to you? That just, that reflects, I could pick on these guys back here. Jeremy, how's God been good to you in terms of that little sweet girl of yours? He's good all the time. She had some scans this week to make sure things are where they need to be, and it was all clear. And we praise God for God. God is good, and we, we can't ever let that go. You know, some things happened this week that, that are difficult for us to, to grab a hold of. One of our missionaries, Carol Klingsmith, wife of Scott Klingsmith, finally got to go home to be with Jesus. After 10 years of battling MS and still ministry, if you ever wanted to meet somebody who believed that God was good, you'd talk to Carol. She couldn't move. She couldn't do anything. She was stuck in a wheelchair all the time, yet she still proclaimed the goodness of God. And then I think of dear Pat Ulbrick, who is in hospice, awaiting, meeting the God that she knows who is good. Please pray for Pat. Pray for her family as they await her home going. And then one other, one other little bit of drama Dear Ray Olson, who usually is standing right back there or wherever June tells him to go. <laughs> He's in the hospital. And God answered my prayer last night. I got a call. Ray called me. Ray Bond called me and said, Ray's in the hospital. He had a stroke. I don't like that word. And I got there and I said, Ray, you are an answer to my prayer because it was a very small stroke. And he smiled at me, and he waved both hands, and I said, praise God. God is good. Even in the midst of the stuff of this life, God is still good. Amen? Amen. 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 Father God, we thank you for our, our time here this morning. I pray that you would use this message to further your kingdom in our hearts. And that we, in turn, would take what you've done in our hearts to change our world, our homes, our neighborhoods, our city, our church. Thank you for meeting us here. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. As far as I know, just if you're wondering, they're hoping Ray's going to be released even today. So praise God for that. All right. A man is walking through the desert, desperate for water, and he saw something in the distance. Well, he walked toward that image, hoping to find water, only to find a, a little old woman sitting at a table covered with neckties. Please, he begged, can I have some water? The woman said, I'm sorry, I don't have any water, but why don't you buy a necktie? Here's one that goes nicely with your outfit. Are you crazy? He shouted, I need some water. 
okay, fine. If you don't want to buy a necktie, I'll still be nice to you. Four miles over that hill is a restaurant, and they will give you all the water you may want. Extremely thirsty man thanked the woman and disappeared over the hill. Three hours later, he came crawling back. The woman said, I told you, about four miles over the hill, you'll find a restaurant and they'll give you all the water that you need. Couldn't you find it? The man said, I found it all right, but they wouldn't let me in because I didn't have a... Yeah, you knew the joke all along, didn't you? (laughs) That's such a silly story, isn't it? But it reminds us this morning that what we do or don't do shapes what we will be tomorrow. Lord, use this message for your kingdom. Open our minds and our hearts. Allow us to see what you're doing in our lives. And may we cooperate. Amen. Amen. You know, we live in an era of heightened spirituality. People are seeking some kind of of spiritual reality from all sorts of outlets. Sadly, some who've become Christians have been deceived by, by false teaching, while others have just walked away because for some reason they've given up on the church. The Apostle Peter was concerned that the the faith of those who believe in Jesus remain steadfast and sound, not carried away by the, the latest theological fad or by their disappointment in the church. This faith is not unchanging. This faith is not mechanical. It's not rule-bound or or isolated from knowledge from other sources. Such faith wrestles with doctrine. It questions methods and rules. This faith respects traditions even while it seeks to change some. It respects traditions even while it seeks to change some. It yearns for a closeness to Christ and for a closeness with others who love him too. Listen to Peter's powerful words in the second book of his, chapter 1, verse 3. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. The knowledge that Peter's referring to is is not about science or or history or cultural diversities or, or even the differences between our faith in Christ and the other isms out there. The knowledge that he's referring to here is a focus on the the genuine, honest, personal, life-changing openness to the true God himself, to the knowledge of him. Now, such such knowledge is is more like opening a gift than attending a a class or a lecture. You see, God, God wraps that knowledge up and he offers it to us, and we open it, and my friends, if we're honest with ourselves, we are dazzled by its grace. You know, grace, that unmerited favor that he extends to us, we're dazzled by his grace and transformed by its love to us. What's the center of this knowledge? Jesus Christ, our Lord. The Christian life and most of us here, if not all of us here are Christians, we know it begins with saving faith in the person of Jesus Christ. But when you know Jesus personally, you also experience, as Peter says, God's power, and this power produces life and godliness. That means the power to grow spiritually and to live godly lives doesn't come from within us. It comes from God himself. 
Folks, God has equipped us. I love this thinking. You know, you see, he's equipped us what, we, what we'll call in the business world an introductory packet. And this packet includes everything that we need. We have access to resources that when we utilize will result in our being useful to God, in our being fruitful for God, both in our relationships with each other and in our relationship with God. But listen, having the right equipment is no guarantee that we will benefit from it. This leads directly into what Peter has to say next. Look at verse 4. The knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. God has given us, at the very moment of our salvation, what Peter calls precious and great promises. Why are they great? Well, they're great because they come from a great God and they lead to a great life. Why are they precious? It's because their value is, is beyond calculation. What are some of those promises? Well, here's just a few. Forgiveness for all of our sins, past, present, and future. Spiritual adoption into God's family by God himself. Spiritual strength through his Holy Spirit. Comfort through suffering and hardship. Provision for all of our needs. Wisdom for living. Hope of heaven when we die. Bodily resurrection when Jesus returns and then reigning with him in heaven for eternity. Has anybody else given you anything that compares to that in this life? I'd love to talk to you. It doesn't happen. These are things that God has given, that he has promised to you and to I who know Jesus. And that list could go on and on and on. Folks, the Lord grants these to us so that we can become what he says are partakers of his divine nature. And, and so we can escape the corruption that is in this world. These two are the, are the positive and negative aspects of putting to use the resources that God has given us and relying on the promises that come along with our salvation. After our new birth in Christ, you and I begin to, to take hold of experientially of all the things that Jesus promised his followers. Folks, you, if, you're, if you've been a Christian as long as I have, you know there is no way to appropriate all these things all at once. It happens over time. These promises encourage us to, to take action and to grow in our faith. Simply put, as we put away the lust and pride in our lives that causes us to, to sin and be corrupted, we are increasingly partaking of that divine nature that Peter is telling us about, which, by the way, enables us to escape the sin and corruption of this world. We become quite literally more and more like Christ in both our inner being and our outward actions. Someone said, if we feed our new nature the nourishment of God's word, then we will have little interest in the garbage of this world. That says it in a great way. In theological circles, we call this the process of sanctification. The new birth at salvation is not the end. It's the beginning. God gives his children, according to Peter, all that they need to live godly lives. But his children must apply themselves and be diligent to use what he's given. Look at verse 5. For this very reason, looking back on what Peter has already said, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, 
and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. Many people today, if you go into any pharmacy, you'll see them all on the racks in front of you, are supplements. Many people today supplement their diets. I do. I take some vitamins on a regular basis, and and I try to eat things that are nutritious at least once a week. (laughs) And the purpose is so to achieve greater physical performance, right, and an overall higher measure of health. Peter says here that we need to do the same thing in our walk with Christ. Because, the, because God has given us his power and his promises, our participation takes the form of what he says is making every effort to supplement our faith. Now, this effort, that phrase, make every effort, means take haste. It means be eager and be determined. It means that we apply ourselves as much as possible. Now, you need to note in this passage, if you have your your Bible open, that faith is already present. Faith is the foundation of the Christian life. Peter lists seven more qualities that we are to add to the foundation of faith. Let's take a quick look at what those are. The first is virtue. Virtue is synonymous with moral excellence. It implies moral fortitude or moral courage. It's the ability to do what's right and to even stand alone for what's right. The second is knowledge. This refers to practical knowledge, knowledge that comes from from keen observation or experience. This knowledge denotes the ability to handle life successfully. It's the opposite, I like this phrase, of being so heavenly minded as to be of no earthly good. You've heard that one before? Yes, that's what it means. It comes with being obedient to the will of God that we discover in God's word. The next is self-control. That's everyone's favorite, right? We must never allow anyone or anything to control us except one. Guys, it's not our wives. Parents, it's not our children. The only one on that list is the Lord Jesus Christ. Not money, not sex, not power, not food, drink, drugs, habits, work, or even our personal goals. It means building the will to say no. Even when a powerful craving inside of you is screaming, yes! Have you had that at the dessert counter ever? I know that's my struggle. I have a hard time. Never mind. Let's move on. It means channeling our natural appetites, those things that drive us towards God's purposes, not our purposes. The next virtue is steadfastness. Believers must must stay on the narrow path even when everything around us is trying to push us off. Do you feel that sometimes? Like you're the only one who's trying to stay on the narrow path and do what's right. That's what being steadfastness is. It's the ability to endure suffering or evil without giving up one's faith. It's not stoic indifference to whatever fate follows. No, that's not it. Instead, steadfastness, or another word that goes along with that is perseverance, that springs from faith in God's goodness. Didn't we just sing about that? Faith in God's goodness and his control over everything that happens in our lives. Steadfastness. At the heart of of spiritual pursuit, which is what we're talking about this morning, is this fifth value. It's godliness. 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 You might want to write this one down. Godliness is an awareness of God in all of life. Godliness is 
an awareness of God in all. That's the word that gets me, in all of life. It's a lifestyle that exemplifies Christ and is empowered by Christ. It describes someone who is right in their relationship with God and their fellow man. He or she lives above the petty things of life, the passions and pressures that control the lives of others. They seek to do the will of God, and in doing so, they seek the welfare of others. The sixth virtue is brotherly affection. We, have a, we, we coin a, a, a word in our culture, it's called a, a bro romance, right? I'm not sure that's exactly what brotherly affection is going for, but brotherly affection here refers to treating fellow Christians as if they were members of your own family. Now, I can't tell you all how to have a healthy family relationship, but I've been around some of you to know, yikes, it's scary in your house. And that's just because we love each other, but we also rub against each other, and sometimes we irritate each other. And so what he's saying here is this brotherly affection means you wrap your arms around that person. It includes living in such a close relationship that we bear one another's burdens. We feel each other's joys and sorrows. We make room for others' opinions, others' ideas, feelings, and even their suggestions. This virtue is key to living in true and harmonious community, whether it's in your home or it's in this church. The last virtue is love. This whole seven-step ladder from the foundation of faith leads us to love. Love. This love puts the other people first. They seek the highest good in others. It's the kind of love that God demonstrated to us when he saved us. Such love among believers allows for weaknesses and imperfections. It deals with problems. It doesn't just cover them up or hope they go away. It affirms others and has a strong commitment and loyalty to one another. Such love holds believers together no matter what persecutions or suffering they may be experiencing. Now, I don't know about you, but I look at that list, that's a little overwhelming. If Peter hadn't prefaced these these steps with the reminder of his provision of his power, these virtues built on the foundation of our faith would seem a bit insurmountable. But when you combine them with God's promises and his presence through the Holy Spirit in our lives, we can take these instructions seriously and even begin to apply them, as Peter said, diligently, knowing that God, God will work in us as we grow more in Christ. Peter then reveals to us in this passage the results of seeking to add these virtues. Look at verse 8. For if, if these qualities are yours and are increasing, They keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind. Anybody here nearsighted like me? How nearsighted are you? If you take your glasses, can you read the words on that screen? No. (laughs) So we all know what he's talking about here when he says we are nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. The first result of having these qualities, Peter says, is fruitfulness. Not fruity, fruitfulness. The more, folks, that we become like Jesus, the more the Spirit can use us in our witness and our service for the Lord. The Christian, in Peter's words, who is not growing is ineffective and unfruitful. Folks, our faith needs to go beyond what we believe. 
It must become a dynamic part of all we are and all we do. You know, some of the most effective and fruitful Christians that I I have known over the many years of ministry are people without dramatic talents or special abilities or even great personalities. Yet God has used them in marvelous ways. Why? Because they are becoming more and more like Jesus. They are fruitful because they're faithful. They are effective because they are growing up spiritually, day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year. The second result is vision. Now, nutritionists tell us that diet can certainly affect one's vision. My mom gave me carrots much more than I preferred. I'm sorry to break that to you, Mom, but it's true. (laughs) The diet affects our vision, and folks, it's absolutely true in the spiritual realm. The Apostle Paul tells us in his letter to the church in Corinth, his second letter, that the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Who's the God of this world? Satan, the devil. The God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them, to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel. Is there any, (laughs) is there any misunderstanding here that why the world thinks of us as it does? That verse right there gives you a clue, doesn't it? Satan has blinded them. A person has to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior before their eyes are opened. And then they can begin to see that God is truly at work. But Peter makes it clear in this verse that not everybody will maintain the effort that leads to spiritual maturity. He says here that some Christians, because this is written to Christians, are spiritually blind. Why? Because they fail to look back on their conversion, look back on what God has already done for them, when God purified them, when God forgave them of their sins. In other words, what he's saying here is they are not living as forgiven sinners. They are behaving like unconverted people. Wow. Those who treasure being forgiven live in a way that pleases God. Peter also notes that some Christians are nearsighted because they fail to look far enough ahead to see the coming of Christ and his reward to the faithful. I've met some Christians who see only their church, only their denomination, but they fail to see the greatness of God's family all over the world. Still others believe or see only the needs in their home, but they have no vision for the lost world, the lost neighbor across the street or across the desk. Folks, those focusing on this present life and and living for themselves will will lack these qualities and, and sadly they'll squander the power that Jesus gives. His promises and the presence of God in their lives that he granted them at their salvation. Folks, if we forget what God has done for us, guess what? We'll not be excited to share Christ with anybody. Wow, I'm telling you, this passage messed with me this week. And I hope God is messing with you as we talk about this today. Brothers and sisters, as as Christians, God has opened our eyes. We can see the world as it is. We have new vision. We need to respond with love and gratitude to God for what he's done 
And then we need to seek to sharpen our spiritual vision. And that's what Peter is after here in this passage today. Someone said, life is too short and the needs of the world too great for God's people to be walking around with their eyes closed. Oh, my prayer this morning is God will open our eyes and remind us of the vision that he's given us from the beginning. Now, Peter finishes his exhortation to to spiritual maturity with yet another appeal to be diligent. Peter's real good at repeating things and reminding us of what he's already said. Look at verse 10. Therefore, brothers, after hearing what he's already said, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. Sounds like a promise to me. Peter tells us here to make certain about God's calling on our lives and God's choosing us to be his child. This is a very urgent and passionate appeal to live out our calling, to demonstrate the reality of our salvation. One commentator writes, one's godly behavior is a warranty deed for himself that Jesus Christ has cleansed him from his past sins and therefore that he is in fact called and chosen. As long as you and I are increasingly pursuing these virtues, they give evidence of God's favor and they enable us to enjoy the third result of these virtues, real assurance, real assurance that he has granted us eternal life. With these things, Peter tells us, comes eternal reward upon Christ's return. Look at verse 11. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You like that verse, don't you? How can you not? Richly provided for you an entrance. What do you think? Do you think we'll have our own entry music? Wouldn't that be awesome? Into the eternal kingdom. That's a big day. Will a crowd be there? Will there be banners? Will there be a jumbotron to make sure we see everybody when we end up in heaven? I don't know. But a richly provided an entrance into heaven. That's got to be an awesome, awesome experience. Folks, God promises a rich welcome into heaven. Looking toward our future eternal life provides the motivation today for living right. We need to center our lives on heaven's priorities, not this world's. That means when we do that, we can face hardships and still be faithful to God because we know what? We have a bright future awaiting us. How wonderful, think about this, to contemplate that God wants us, that God is expecting us, and that God right now is waiting for us. Think about that. God wants us. He's expecting us. And right now, he's waiting for us. Folks, this passage messed with me, and and I hope it's doing the same with you. If Peter here wanted to wake up complacent Christians who had listened to the false teachers around them and believed, get this, that because salvation was achieved by grace and not good works, they could live any way they wanted. And that's what was happening in his world around him. Peter told them here in this passage, and he's telling us, salvation is by grace. But if you are the Lord's, and if your service to him backs up your claim to be chosen by God, you 
will be able to resist the lure of false teaching. You'll be able to identify it. You'll also be able to resist glamorous sin in any way, shape, or form. With that said, I want us to consider this question. What does your life say about your faith? What does your life, how you are living, say to the world around us about your faith? Do people around you know that that you're a Christian? If so, how? If not, why not? Throughout the Bible, it points to history's conclusion, and I'm looking forward to this day when all believers will live with God together. Because of God's love, folks, and God's grace, he wants to share that future with us and indeed help us share that future with others. So with that said, are you living for today or for the future? challenge is that we begin to live for the future, not so much for today. I want you to bow your heads and just listen to this last little bit and we'll be done. Life oft times may be tedious, discouraging, or hurtful, but God promises a bright tomorrow when all his holiness will shine. And all your devotion to him will be revealed. Listen, you're drawing closer every day. Keep up the good work. Never even think of giving up. For Jesus is waiting to welcome you at the finish line with these words. Folks, look up at the screen and read these words with me. Well done, my faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Oh, how I want to hear those words from Jesus' lips. Well done, my faithful servant. May that remind us today of why we're here, that we are God's witness, and may our joy be found in Jesus, but as well in sharing Jesus with those around about us. May we change what's wrong and make it right. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this reminder this morning for me and, Lord, for these, my dear brothers and sisters, how important it is to live for you, to live looking towards the future. We love you. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys so much for being here. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. We'll see you back here next Sunday. Lord bless.